You're listening to The Partially Examined Life, a philosophy podcast by some guys who at one point set on doing philosophy for a living, but then thought better of it. Our question for episode 138 is, what is perception? And we read Seeing Things As They Are, A Theory of Perception by John Searle, published in 2015. And we're going to have him on as a guest. You can join the discussion, get the text, and lots more information at partiallyexaminedlife.com. This is Mark Linton Meyer, probably not hallucinating, in Madison, Wisconsin. This is Wes Alwyn in Boston, Massachusetts. This is Dylan Casey in Middleton, Wisconsin. All right, so before John comes on, what did you guys think of this book? It was one of the most fun philosophical works I've read in a long time, <laughs> just in terms of the writing. It's curmudgeonly. In a very pleasant way. And it's straightforward and easy to read. It's straightforward and easy to read and repeats himself enough that I didn't even take notes on this thing because he just, like, the main points, he repeats so many times, not in an irritating way, but in kind of a teaching you way that I felt like, no, I've mastered the vocabulary more or less by the time I was done with this. Yep. And the most technical parts are sort of in the middle. There are two chapters there that sort of get to the meat of his point. You have to pay more attention in those sections than the earlier ones, but... Yeah, chapter four is really the heart of it. And for listeners who want to skip forward to the solution, his positive account, it's really between pages 114 to 134 that he gives his... Exactly. Yeah. Though it, it is really helpful to read his description of the bad argument and basically his indictment of 400 years of philosophy, <laughs> maybe 2,400 years of philosophy. It does help to clarify his positive point of view, what he's reacting against and the way in which he understands the mistakes of the past. And he says it in a very pleasantly curmudgeonly way. So, <laughs> so it's, it's a basically a work of epistemology of how we know the world, and he's in favor of direct realism, naive realism, the basic kind of thing that every non-philosopher supposedly has. But in the course of explaining this structure of how we know the world, he does give us a picture of what he thinks consciousness is. He's most famous as a philosopher of mind. We covered him on our introductory episode to philosophy of mind long, long, long ago. His Chinese room argument against functionalism, against thinking of consciousness as something that any structure in a computer program, for instance, might have. He thinks that there's something specifically biological about it. He thinks that the way that we would end up investigating it more is through neurobiology. Pretty much everything he's famous for is all wrapped up in here in some way. And in fact, not just referred to, but like given in a digest form. Well, let's uh, go ahead and bring him on. Okay, so how are we doing? So we want to hopefully not just induce you to give the same stump speech about it that you've given 19 times already. In fact, we will... No, I haven't. No, no. Once I write a book, I forget all about it. I'm working on four other books. But this seemed a great way in, not only is perception itself a key element in philosophy. Yeah. In fact, what I was expecting out of this was more the scientific details and am kind of pleasantly surprised that you, in the fashion that we usually do in these discussions ourselves, being philosophy people and not science people, yeah. said, yes, of course there is a physiological story about how perception... Yeah. And we don't know the, all the details either. But anyway, you know some of them. Yeah. That is neither sufficient nor necessary to actually have a philosophical understanding of perception. But not just that, it doesn't have explanatory value for yeah, explaining... We still the, have philosophical problems left over. Right. You're right, right. So if we can give the listeners a picture of your view, and maybe you can help us feel around the history and the related views. I know that the main... So we've been doing this podcast for about six years, and we have yeah. we usually read a classic work. So we've gone through, we did Barclay, we did Hume, we've done many of the others. We did Hegel yeah. quite recently. Uh, uh, and Schopenhauer. Yes. Uh, so God. many of the people that you... One disaster after another. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I know from the start, I've been arguing for some kind of direct realism, and Wes yeah. never fails to point out, no, that can't account for the problem of illusion. That if you see perception as a simple openness to the environment, as a simple connectivity between exactly. me and the things around me, then, well, how do you have, you need something in between. And so your solution seems to be, well, no, it's not something that we're aware of in between. It's, it's not, not in between. Exactly. Yes. We're not aware of our own ideas, but yes, there is a mechanism, the, yeah. the, the perceptive mechanism by which we hook to the world. So that gives us the aspect in which the world is presented to us. And so... Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, so say more about that in terms of how that accounts for illusion. Okay. Well, here we go. Let's take vision. That's the most... Uh, that's everybody's favorite uh, sensory modality. 
Whenever you see anything consciously, you have a conscious visual experience that goes on in the head. Now, the crucial thing to point out is you don't see the visual experience. You see objects and states of affairs in the world. Right now, I'm looking at a computer screen with a lot of squiggles on it, but that's what I actually see. In order that I should see it, there has to be an event in my head, but that event is itself the seeing, and you can't see the seeing. Okay, now that I think is obviously the right thing to say, but nobody in the history of philosophy ever says it. What they say is something like the following. Look, you could be having exactly the same visual experience, even if it was a hallucination. But in the hallucination case, you did see something, though not a material object. Whatever you see in that case is what you see in the ordinary, in the veridical case. Therefore, you never see the real world. You just see what's on in your head. Now, that argument is so bad. I call it the bad argument. And the crucial step is to say, in the hallucination case, you see something. And the answer is, in the hallucination case, you don't see anything. It's exactly as if you were seeing something because you have the experience in your head, but you don't see the experience. That's the crucial mistake. Once you say that, then you're off and running with traditional epistemology. You're back in bed with Locke, Barclay, Hume, Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, Kant, Hegel, Schmegel, and all the rest of them. Every disaster in the history of the subject, just about since the 17th century, makes the mistake of denying direct realism, of denying that we actually see objects and states of affairs in the world, which we do. And the reason they make that mistake is they think you can't account for hallucinations. And the answer is, of course you can, because the answer to the question in the hallucination case, what's going on, what's going on is you have an experience in the head which is just like seeing something, but you don't see anything. It seems that you are, but you're not. That's what makes it a hallucination. Now, if everybody had understood what I just said, the history of epistemology would have been different. But anyway, that's a short summary of that part of the book. Can we cash this out in terms of a few of the classic skeptical challenges? So it seemed like I saw a bent stick. So how can I account for that? Yeah, okay. Well, there are a whole lot of famous cases, and here's how they go. You look at the stick in water, and as they say, it looks bent. Now, here's the crucial step. Well, the stick wasn't bent, but all the same, you did see something bent. You saw the bent appearance of the stick, But then you didn't see the stick, you only saw its appearance, and that's an idea or a sense datum. Now, this argument is so bad, it gives me a stomachache even to repeat it on a podcast. What's wrong with it is to say that you really did see a bent object. You didn't see a bent object. And to say you saw a bent appearance is just to say you saw the way it looked. What you saw was a straight object, and it looked bent under those circumstances. But it doesn't follow from that that you were actually were seeing something bent. You weren't. You were having a visual experience, which is something like seeing something bent. And that's what you gave you the impression that you were seeing a bent stick when you weren't. Anyway, there are a whole lot of bad arguments like this one, but we can go through them if it's fun. Well, let's at least get some of your vocabulary for the positive account of this so that it's the subjective, intentional. Let me give you some vocabulary. The key to understanding perception is to recognize the special form of the intentionality of perception. Now, intentionality is just a fancy word, but it means the way the mind is directed at objects and states of affairs in the world. It does not have any special connection with intending. That's just one kind of intentionality among others. The reason, by the way, we got this word is like most confused words. We got it from the Germans. And in German, you don't make the mistake of supposing that intentionality which is intentionality, is the same as opposite, which is the same as intending in the ordinary sense. Okay, so that's step one. you got to understand that perceptual experiences are directed. They have intentionality. But step two is you got to see they're special. They're not like just thinking about something because you're directly aware of it. I say the intentionality is presentational. When I see an object, it is directly presented to me. It's right there in my experience. And then the third feature is it's causal. So it's presentational, intentional, and the form of the intentionality is causal. So I experience my present experiences as caused by the objects and states of affairs that I'm seeing. Now, if you understand those three features, intentionality, presentation, and causal, causally self-reflexive, because it's part of the condition of satisfaction of the intention that it has to be caused by the very thing that you're seeing. If you understand those, you're way ahead of the past 300 years in epistemology, which in one way or another rests on a denial of them. But this is the key to understanding perception. 
is to see that it's in conscious perception, which is the form that matters most, is directly intentional. You're directly presented with objects and states of affairs in the world. It's presentational and not representational. You don't see a picture of the object. You see the object itself. And the reason you do that is because the object directly causes the perceptual experience. Now, again, I'm giving you a very short summary, but that's the key to understanding perceptual intentionality. And if people had understood that, we wouldn't have this disastrous history of 300 years of, of uh, confused epistemology. The epistemology question arises because it turns out you didn't really see objects and states of affairs in the world. That would be realism, which I think is true, uh, realism. But they deny that. They say all you see are the contents of your mind. But then there's a horrible question. What's the relation between the objects that you do see, namely your own experiences, and the objects in the world that you don't see? And worse yet, how can you get knowledge of objects in the world if you can never see them? You can only see the contents of your own mind. And if anybody studied any philosophy over the past 400 years knows that the history of epistemology is a history of bad answers to that question. Uh, Locke and Descartes gave one bad answer. You don't see the real world. You see pictures of the real world. Barclay uh, gave another, even worse answer. The real world just consists in your pictures. Uh, the real world just consists in, in ideas. And then you're off and running with Hume. And finally, you get to Kant. And I can't even get you a, a short summary of Kant. But basically, the idea is there's a real world out there. There's a thing in itself. But you can never perceive that. All you perceive are your representations of the world. Okay, now, I think each of these is a disastrous view. And I pre try to present what I think is the correct philosophical and scientific view, typically in a reasonable perceptual situation, such as I'm now in, I see objects and states of affairs, I see them directly, I don't see anything else by way of which I see them, and my seeing consists in having perceptual experiences which give me a direct presentation of reality. How's that for a quick summary? <laughs> Could you just say a little bit more about mistakes? What you just accounted for was a disastrous way in which the history of philosophy accounts for mistakes in terms yeah. of hallucinations. But yeah. in your book, you have this account of perception. And what I found myself at the end wondering is a little bit more about how we end up being wrong and deciding wrong. So somehow the right way to approach epistemology, which would amount to taking your theory of perception and then having an account of how we establish Veridicality. 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 Whatever it is. Truth. Yeah. And Dylan, did you have in mind the misidentifications? Like, I know a lot of the mistakes we've talked about in the past on here are, yes, we could be correct about what many philosophers would call the sense data, but what you talk about as the basic perceptual layer that's colors and shapes. The basic perceptual experience. Yeah. The way we're normally wrong about things is we misidentify, I thought that was a dog, it's in fact not a dog, seeing a mirage, I am seeing yeah. something, I'm seeing some shapes, but I think it's water, it's not, that kind of thing. Is that what you're talking yeah. about, Dylan, or are you still? Yeah, that would be one layer of it. And then another one would be, in some ways, more interesting ones where you have a way of looking at the world with objects that you say that you see, and then you change the way you think of the world, and you change the kinds of objects you understand the world to be in terms yeah. of. Right. That's sort of a more interesting case. The first one, I think, would be, in some ways, it's the proper way to understand the bent stick case or the proper way to understand my just being wrong about the car in my garage, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, OK, there are different kinds of cases. And I think in real world examples, uh, we're more concerned with misidentifying. I saw a woman in the crowd uh, that looked like my sister, but when I got close, I realized it wasn't my sister. I saw in a car in the garage, it was dark, and I thought it was my car, and I couldn't figure out why the key wouldn't go in, but I was mistaken. It wasn't my car. Now, those are not the cases that bother a traditional epistemology. Traditional epistemology, and I'm thinking now the great heroes, uh, Descartes, Locke, Barclay, and all the rest of them, they are concerned with the question, how can I get knowledge of the world when I can't really perceive it directly. All I can perceive are my own sense data, my own ideas, my own impressions. And then Hume's answer is, how can I believe the world has a continuous and distinct existence when all I can ever perceive are my own experiences, which don't have a continuous and distinct existence? So traditional epistemology, I think, makes the issue much less interesting. I think the other issues are much more interesting. By what means... Do I recognize something as an object and under what conditions do I typically 
misrecognize it. But that's not what the debates between um, uh, Barclay and uh, Locke or other representative theorists, that's not what they were about. They were uh, given uh, the assumption that all you can perceive are your own perceptual experiences. How can you get objective knowledge of the real world? And that, I'm saying, is a misconceived nature of the question because it's not true that all you can see are your own experiences. Typically, what you see are objects in the world. Now, sometimes you uh, don't see them in such a way that they present themselves as they really are. Uh, the stick looks bent, but it's not really bent. Now, as Austin pointed out, it doesn't really look like a bent stick. It looks like a straight stick in water. But in any case, we know what they're getting at. It's sort of like a bent stick. Wes, do you want to start us on some of the problems you have with this view? <clears throat> yeah, tell, tell me the problems well, that I bother don't, you. And, well, well here's, here's one of them. I don't think that traditional epistemology, I don't think the solution, I don't think they're actually thinking that we perceive only our representations in the typical sense of perceive. Yes, what Descartes thought. But I think it's an equivocation on the word perceive. If it were really the same sort of perception as we think of as of objects outside of ourselves, yeah. then all the same epistemological problems would arise within that scheme between perceiving the representation and the perceiver. There has to be an immediacy to it. And I think they would, in many cases, accept your view of it, which is that there has to be this immediate awareness of or having of the experience, yeah. and that it's a loose way of speaking to, to talk of these representations. So, for instance, in the case of Kant, you know, he says we know only the appearances, but I think the appearances are sort of built out of intuitions, and the intuitions aren't exactly of the appearances. I think that, in a way, that's not material, because you, you do sort of have an analogous task in this book, to the task of traditional epistemologists. So they might have been figuring out how it is we can know the world if we're cut off from it. And you're trying to figure out how it is that the qualitative features of our visual experiences present the conditions of satisfaction that they do, where conditions yeah, of satisfaction yeah. just means objects and states of affairs. Exactly. So you, yeah. you have an analogous puzzle that you're trying to solve. And I think whether or not I'm right about traditional yeah. epistemologists, I think they could be persuaded by you. And I think they would say, well, this is actually, this puzzle that you're talking about is kind of the same sort of puzzle that we were worried about. You just have a clearer view of it than we did. Yeah. Well, I don't, I think they would concede that much. But if you remember what these guys actually said, uh, Hume says the contents of the mind divide themselves to impressions and ideas. And the difference between them is one of force and vivacity. But then it turns out all we're aware of uh, directly are the impressions and ideas, and in perception, all we are aware of is the impressions. Now, says Hume, how can we believe that we perceive objects with a continued and distinct existence when all we can perceive are our own impressions? Right, but you, you concede this use of the, the phrase aware of, though, in the book. You're happy with the, the phrase aware of in relation to our own visual experiences. It's just, if that aware of, as long as it's not intentional towards representation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Provide the, you think that the experiences are not the object of perception. When I see this thing in front of me, I do have a visual experience, but I don't see the visual experience. That's the difference between me and the tradition. Those guys thought, no, you perceive the impression or the representation or the idea in, in Descartes and Locke. So I think this is important about the history of philosophy. Now, however, you're right at this point. Okay, once I throw out the tradition, once I say, look, typically you have direct awareness of objects and states of affairs in the world, you have direct realism, uh, then I am confronted with uh, various kinds of questions. And the most interesting question is one that the philosophical tradition can't even ask. And that's the question, what fact about the conscious visual experience, considered just as an event in the world like any other, what fact gives it the conditions of satisfaction that it does? What fact about my experience right now makes it the case that it's one of seeming to see a red book? And that's a fascinating question, and I try to answer that. But the important thing I want to say now is if you're locked into the tradition, they can't even see that as a question because they don't start with the intentionality of perception. If you start, as I do, with the intentionality of perception, then there's a question. What is it about the event of experiencing, Consider it just as an event in the world like any other, that makes it have the content that it does, that makes it seem as if I'm seeing a red book? And that, I think, is a fascinating question. Yeah, and I, I think a traditionalist might see your answer as an ingenious answer to the question of how we get in touch with things in themselves. 
I don't know. Are we jumping ahead to try and say what this answer is now? Or um... No, no, I think that is. OK, let me say what the answer is. I think these guys can't pose the question, but I think the empiricists were right. And this has been lost in recent philosophy to think there must be some kind of conceptual or logical or internal relation between the character of the experience and the character of the world that I seem to be perceiving. And I think that instinct, that intuition is right. And what I want to say is, first of all, perception is hierarchical. There's no way I can see that it's my car without seeing that it's a certain kind of car. And there's no way I can see it's a certain kind of car without seeing that it's a car. And I can't see that it's a car without seeing such things as colors and shape. So eventually you reach, you reach rock bottom. You have basic perceptual experiences of basic perceptual features of the world. Now here's the question. What fact about the raw phenomenology, the raw feel of my experiences, makes it the case that they are seeming to see the basic features? And I say, and this I think is in the spirit of traditional, or at least empiricist epistemology, and that is part of what it is for an object to be read is for it to be able to cause experiences like this. And then this one is a case of seeing something that seems to be read, of seeming to see something read, precisely because red is defined. Red consists in the ability, at least in part, to cause experiences like this. And that, I think, is very much in the spirit of traditional epistemology, at least empiricist epistemology, the one at a, a conceptual connection between the character of our experience and the character of the reality that it's experience of. Now, those guys never got a, a coherent account of that because they didn't see that the, you don't see the visual experience. But if you subtract that in the in light of uh, your suggestion, let's think of them as agreeing with me on direct realism, then we have a, a question. What fact about the visual experience gives it the content that it has? And I say, starting at the bottom, there has to be a connection between the character of the experience and the character of the basic feature in the world that you're seeing. It's being read consists in its ability to cause experiences like this. It's being a straight line consists in part in its ability to cause experiences like this. So I think maybe that's what you're driving yeah. at, is that once you get rid of the mistake, the bad argument, you still have an interesting question. And it's very much in the spirit of traditional epistemology. And that is, what fact about the raw, brute data of our experiences gives them the content they have? And I'm trying to answer that. And just for our listeners, I think maybe we could try and characterize the, the question in a few different ways. Because the way I think about it, and maybe this isn't quite right, is sort of how intentionality sort of reaches out and touches objects in the world. That's a good way to think of it, yeah. One of the ways that you put it is how does this subjective qualitative experience present the objects, or what you call the conditions of satisfaction of intentionality, right. but really we're just talking about objects and states of affairs. How do they present the objects, or how are we in yeah. touch with objects through that intentionality? And I think the answer, it's ingenious, it's something I've never seen before. The idea is that these objects just are the capacity to cause certain types of experience, and yeah. we experience them as such. We experience them as causing this experience. So yeah. there's this sort of direct, I don't know if it's identity, but there's this direct... Uh, Presentational is my word. Yeah. Well, at least the secondary qualities are objects of the type that would, they right. are defined, as you said, Wes, as the type that would cause this kind of experience. Because you can't right. just say a shape is, a circle is the kind that would cause, you can't solely define circularity in terms of the kind of thing that would cause a visual experience of a circle. Oh, that's right. And it seems on your account, John, that you can't even say it would give you a visual and a tactile and, you know, you can't even just add, you never want to reduce the physicality of the world to dispositions to cause yeah. sensations in us. That comes down to some kind of phenomenalism, even if you don't mean to make it. Yeah, no, no, yeah. that's not my view. Absolutely not. Uh, my view is not phenomenalist. Let me put the view very simply. I now have an experience of looking at a red book. Now, that experience, the raw experience, is an event in the world like any other. Now, what fact about that raw experience makes it the case that if I have that experience, it must be the case of seeming to see something red? And I think part of the answer, not the whole answer, but part of the answer is that for something to be red, is for it to be capable of causing experiences like this. Similarly, enough for some of the primary qualities, for it to be a straight line, is for it to be capable, at least in part, 
of causing experiences like this. Now, in the case of the geometrical features like uh, circularity and straight line and so on, we're less inclined to accept that because we have non-perceptual definitions of those. We have geometric definitions of those. Well, that suits me fine. All the same, I want to say there is a conceptual conception be seen something being red and it's being able to cause this kind of experience and something's being a straight line and it's being able to cause this kind of experience. That doesn't solve all your problems. Then you're off and running because, of course, being a straight line isn't like being a Porsche 911 type of car because there that the car is not defined in terms of its ability to cause experiences. So the question is, how do you get the complexity? How do you get the complexity that goes in high-level recognition? And that's a much tougher question, and I don't try to answer that question in this book. I'm still back with the basic perceptual features. However, it's important to see, I'm not trying to tell you how the world is as such, but rather answer to the question, what fact about the world's being that way enables me to perceive it that way? And that seems to me a a well-defined philosophical question. I see the appeal you know, when I see red that, well, the reason I identify it as red is because it's similar to other reds that I've seen. In some ways, all these basic things are defined in terms of ostention and similarity to past experiences. But you're saying the similarity to past experiences has built right within it. I'm not just comparing my experience to my past experiences, uh, exactly. but I'm making some claim about the world. Well, whatever it is that causes red appearances. This raw feel, right. It's here and it's here. And if I then maybe could have a mistaken impression later. I think that I'm seeing red, but in fact, the underlying thing doesn't actually have that. It's brown, but it's in a weird light or something like that. No, absolutely. This certainly is not an answer uh, to various forms of skepticism because you can still be mistaken. The question is, what counts as a mistake? And what counts as a mistake has to be determined by the content of the experience. And then the question is, how does the experience get the content that it does? That's not a question in experimental psychology. That's a question in analytic philosophy. What fact about the character of this experience gives it the logical content that it has, makes it the case if that that experience, it's going to seem to you you're seeing something red. That's the point. I mean, it's a little distressing to me that something that seems so basic like seeing red, it ends up seeing you're attributing some kind of disposition to the environment, right? Mm-hmm. You're saying that yes. uh, this red is actually, it's the kind of thing that, it's not just giving me red right now, but that it would give other people red and it would give exactly. in, in any other, you know, it's making a general claim. Why is that disturbing? That seems like the condition under which you would be able to do any kind of investigation at all in which you would be able to have any kind of common experience at all. I mean, yeah, that doesn't disturb me. Well, here, here's why it might be it might be disturbing, I think, because we want to think of objects as more than their capacities to cause certain types of experience in beings like us. We might say, look, on your account, we're still cut off from the things of themselves because it can't be the case that 13 billion years ago there was a big bang and the substance of the world that spilled out was capacities to cause experiences in (laughs) beings like us. Why does that claim mean that that's all that there is? It does, yeah, you're right. It doesn't mean that it's all that there is, but it means that there's something that we don't have awareness of. There's still something left over in the object, which is not capable of being experienced. That's exactly right. That's why the world is more rich than our perceptual experience. That, that's why we can discover things. What physics is supposed to tell us. Uh, physics is supposed to tell us. Yes, or any, or, or any other kind of inquiry. Any right? other science, what the object is really once you get beyond the immediate experiences. In other words, my aim is not an ontological question about what's the ultimate nature of reality. That's not it. The question is, what is it about the ultimate nature of reality that makes certain perceptual experiences seem to be saying this and not that? But that doesn't answer the question, yes, and what more is there to tell us about physical objects? Because that's not the question I'm addressing. Yeah, and in fact, in a way, it makes much more sensible an account of, okay, so before 1805 or 1790, we had no notion of voltaic energy and all the stuff that would go into thinking about the electrical world. And as we looked at the world more closely, we began through a combination of technology and experiment and inquiry, just looking at the world, the world presented itself as we looked at it in new ways with phenomena that we had never seen or understood before. And it's not as if that phenomena 
wasn't always there. That phenomena was always there. It was always there to be be looked yeah, at and right. observed. But physics is just giving us more experiences that are systematically related to everyday experiences. Yes. It's not yeah, giving but, us this yeah. thing that I talked about as leftover. If red is, in part, the disposition to cause experiences of, of red in us, and there's something left over, does physics really give us the thing that's left over there beyond the disposition? Isn't physics just giving us more experiences that are correspond to other, that other dispositions? This is a, a Barclayan approach. What I'm saying is there is a real world that exists entirely independently of our perceptions and our representations, and we use our perceptions to get at that real world and its features, which exist quite independently of experience. Atomic physics is not about the structure of our experiences. We learn about atomic physics by doing experiments, but the subject matter is not phenomenology. I think what I was referring to as disturbing in quotes was that there's something appealing intuitively about, say, Russell's picture that you could have a very simple experience, the seeing the red dot, say, that then you could build something out of. But on your view, which I, I actually am very sympathetic to, you always have, so for instance, every perception has a whole conception of cause built into it. And this is something we haven't talked about yet, but that, that you argue specifically against the empiricist, against Hume's version of causation as uh, something that's additional. You know, we have an experience of billiard ball one, we have an experience of billiard ball two, and then something about the mind hooks those together and yeah. posits a necessary connection. So it's like we're at least inferring. We're at least, you know, we see one hit another, maybe actually these two billiard balls were just pictures on a computer screen. And so it's the, the program that caused both images. It's not one that caused the movement of the other at all, yeah. but it just appears to us this way. And, th and that's sort of always the situation that we're in where we don't yeah. know what's going on behind the scenes. And according to your view, even seeing an individual thing, not even just seeing two in a row, but even just seeing the simplest possible perception. Exactly. You posit this as caused by the environment. You experience necessary connection. Hume was wrong that you don't experience necessary connection. You experience it pretty much all of your waking life because in all perception and action, you have causally self-reflexive presentational experiences and the causation is part of the very content of the experience. I experience my present visual experience as caused by the object I'm seeing. So now gone from one great disaster to another one. The three greatest disasters are one, the mind-body disaster, two, the, the bad argument about perception that you can't see the real world, and the third great disaster is causation, that there's no causes in the real world. It's just a kind of illusion we got from observing constant conjunction. That's Hume's contribution to the list of disasters. Disasters. Wes, do you want to take this? Or... Uh, no, I mean, I think I was just uh, yeah, I think kind of, probably kind with of me drifting off into it, it sounds so. Has anyone said this reminds them of Schopenhauer? God knows. I don't know enough Schopenhauer to be reminded. Because Schopenhauer made a big deal of the idea that one of the most important features of perceptions is that we perceive them as caused. And this, in a way, is one of sort of the founding insights of all his elaborations of. German ideology and is the consequence of it is that he thinks that the causality of the world is actually the thing that we have the best access to contra Humean skepticism and it becomes sort of the thing in itself and he identifies that with will and so on when I look at this idea let me quote from your book here just to give another yeah. read listeners another taste of your solution experience of having this conscious visual experience necessarily carries the intentionality that it does because the feature in question is experienced as caused by its object, and its yeah. object is precisely constituted, at least in part, by its ability to cause this type of experience. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I don't remember that passage. It's almost as if you say, well, what is it that we have access to in this sort of immediate direct way? And it's almost as if what we have access to most primally is the causal nature of things. I don't know if that's right or not. Well, there is something right about it. The important thing though, to remember here is that causation is not the object of the perception. You don't see causation. Right. Rather, in seeing anything, your experience, your experience as caused by the object you're right. seeing. Just to generalize on Wes's comment about Schopenhauer, so we just got finished with a bunch of Hegel, and Hegel's big objection to Kant was that Kant said exactly as you say, that we only have access to our appearances, we don't have access to things themselves, and Hegel is denying this. 
And it's hard to see what Hegel's ultimate solution is. And I don't want to get into even attempting yeah. Hegel exegesis Hegel at this point. Yeah. It could be, you know, some high level version of Barclay and idealism, but even Barclay and yeah. idealism. And I think this goes for Kant himself certainly allowed for the objectivity of science. It's not a matter of once you get like Barclay does and say, well, everything is an idea including things that were existent on the world centuries before any of us were around. Then yeah. he's not using the word idea in anything like... Well, they're ideas in God's mind, primarily. Yes. I'm not saying anything like any of that. <laughs> that is, I'm not saying with Kant that we don't see the world of things in themselves. I right now, in front of me, see a book in itself. And I see the book on Zik, and I see it as it is in itself. <laughs> well, so this is kind of what I'm trying to get at the history of philosophy, is it seems what you're describing about Locke and Hume and those folks and Descartes is correct, but that starting with Kant, everybody yeah. post-Kant, Schopenhauer, Hegel, yeah. Frege, Husserl, yeah. up the line, all of them agreed more with your view, or at least had some objection. No, of course we don't see only our own ideas. We see yeah. the things themselves. They just have maybe different vocabulary of talking about it. Yeah. It sounds like you just have found it not so useful. Their solution is representational, right? And exactly. It, instead exactly. of, yeah. For those guys, the things in themselves consist in representations, and that's not my view at all. But not just that. We might have a representational theory where we say, well, you know, how is it that our experiences are of the objects? And we say, well, it's they're similar, or we could give a causal account, and you reject both of those. I reject absolutely both of those. That is to say, it isn't that my experience looks like the object. I can't see my experience, so it doesn't look like anything. Rather, my experience has a certain intentional content in virtue of its features, and the intentional content presents features of the objects for reasons that I try to explain. But um, I, I think it's probably not helpful to think, well, how is that like Schopenhauer? It's probably not at all like Schopenhauer, but I don't know enough about Schopenhauer to have an intelligent opinion. I know a bit more about Kant, but the fact is Kant made it impossible for us ever to give an intelligent account of perception because he denied that you can perceive the object in itself as it is in itself, and that's exactly what I'm insisting on. It seems like a lot of the intuitive force of a view like Kant's or a view like Schopenhauer, I mean, Schopenhauer and Kant both thought you could vigorously do science, that there are things within the realm of possible experience, and you, know, yeah. you could add Charles Sanders Peirce or people like this to the list, that we don't know right now, so they're not my ideas right now, they're not your ideas right now, but they're in the, the realm of potential experiences. And so there's room for digging beneath the surfaces of things. There is room yeah. for getting at an aspect of things in, them, in, in themselves. Schopenhauer, again, has this vigorous picture of science, but beyond that, thinks that still this entire realm of objects, the objects of science, is a mere skin over yeah. the real world, which is will, which is something crazy and spiritual. And okay. So I think it's perfectly compatible with what you're saying that what is giving me the sensation of red or anything else has as one of its properties, the fact that it causes that sort of sensation. The way I've been referring this throughout is aspectualism. Yeah. I like your talk of intentionality a little better, but there's still the possibility that you're seeing the tip of the iceberg. The reason you might get into philosophy in the first place is a religious motivation, is some spiritual reason, yeah. and still it could be that the things that science explores are a mere skin upon the much more philosophically important stuff. There's nothing in your view, I think, that necessarily denies that. It's just... It, no, but I do deny it for independent reasons. Sure, it's false. Sure. <laughs> yeah, the, the actual iceberg is made of molecular structure. It's made of uh, entities we find it convenient to call particles. They're probably points of mass energy, but there is a complex physical structure to the world and there's a complex physical structure to my neurobiological apparatus, and it's the interaction of those two that gives me the conscious experiences that I have. So there's a whole lot more to the world than what we can immediately perceive, but what there is is straightforward physical reality. There's nothing spiritual about it. There's no uh, ghosts running around in it. There's nothing transcendental. It's just the physical world as described by physics and chemistry. Even if I put aside the question of ghosts or other kinds of things that were non-physical, one of the reasons I think that you would go down the road of something like Kant is that when you have a statement like seeing things as they are or make claims about the world presenting itself and that you see reality is the absence of the completion of that. That is, as Mark was saying, you see an aspect of it and you talk about this in your book. And so what is bothersome about that when talking about seeing the world or seeing it as it is, especially when you yeah. put the force of that ontological 
character to it is feels like it implies a complete knowledge, a complete seeing, a complete understanding. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that means. And that part of the reaction of all of the representationalists and idealists and all that is that part of their answer is trying to account for the fact, whether it be through mistakes or illusions or something, that whatever it is that we perceive in the world, we don't have access to it all. In in some ways, that's sort of a a dumbed-down version to me of why Kant would deny our ability to see the things in themselves. Well, I think, you know, as uh, John, as you point out in your book, Barclay has an insight, which you accept, which is that a representational theory that says the way we know things is to, or the way our representations work is to be Look at pictures. Yeah. similar to objects doesn't make any sense. And Kant accepts that fully. And because he accepts that, he's puzzled about how knowledge works. How is it that we can know things if these sorts of explanations all fail? Right. He wants to preserve And then knowledge. he gives the wrong answer. Right. So he sort of like retreats into the little house of consciousness where we yeah. can ha- all have immediate access to these things called appearances because that's the only way he can see as a giving us knowledge. He doesn't think yeah. there's a coherent view of knowledge of things in themselves because he doesn't think we can go out and compare the thing in itself as distinct from knowledge to knowledge. He doesn't think that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, but he's right. But it's a mistake to think you have to do that, that somehow I have to compare my picture of the world with the world. That's not what happens. I just investigate the world directly. And in doing that, I have conscious experiences. And often they give me an accurate conception yeah. of how things are in the world. Now, there's a deep mistake implicit in some of the things you said. And that is from the fact that you always perceive under an aspect, under one aspect and not another, it doesn't follow that you don't perceive the thing in itself and perceive it as it really is. I perceive this object under the aspect of being a book. And guess what? It really is a book. The thing in itself is a big book. Kant thought you had to sacrifice the thing in itself to get directness. That's basically the trade-off he made. Yeah, he's mistaken. He's mistaken. Yeah, your idea is that we can have both the thing in itself and directness. Yeah. But to do that, we need to explain how that directness works, which I think, again, we've discussed how you give an explanation of that. Yeah. We also sacrifice completion. One of the one, I, don't, I one, don't know what completion is. I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, I have a book in front of me, and I can tell you a lot about the book, but of course, I can't tell you about the molecular structure. And then, if somebody could tell me about, it, they'd have to tell me about the submolecular structure. And then, I guess somebody might say, "Well, you've got to really discuss the relationship between the book and all the other objects in the universe." But so what? I mean, if that's completion, I don't need it. What I need is well-defined questions with well-defined answers. I agree with you, but I'm also trying to understand maybe wrongheadedly, the kind of concern that would give rise to the bad argument. Yeah. And it seems to me a part of that has to do with, maybe I would characterize it, a mistaken notion of completion, in the sense that... Yeah, it could be, yeah. One thing that Kant's move would do would be within that constrained realm, present the possibility for knowing everything there was to know. And that would be the standard on which, so that you would be able to know all that there was. So that in that realm of knowing, then you would have complete coverage of that. And that was sort of the ground of certainty. Another way of understanding the form of the bad argument, the way you present it, is a kind of misguided quest for a peculiar kind of certainty. One way I characterize your account is that you say that kind of certainty is not necessary. That's not what being right and understanding the way in which... um, the states of affairs are and how we establish veracity of the world is not through understanding things completely and then saying, okay, that's how it lines up. That's not how it works. So I, yeah, I don't see it as a quest for certainty. It's not that he wants certainty. He just wants to say how knowledge is possible at all. He assumes there is such a thing as knowledge. He wants to save science from skepticism. But he thinks there has to be synthetic a priori, and I don't think that. I don't know why you guys want to put me in bed with Kant and all these other guys. I think they're all hopelessly confused. We're trying to distinguish you from Kant. I mean, it's, yeah. I was trying to put you in bed with the post-Kantians to some extent because I feel like... All right. No, no, I don't want to go with Hegel and Schmegel and all those guys. Forget (laughs) it. I mean, I'm totally unsympathetic. The whole approach seems to me absolutely crackpot. I mean, that there is this spiritual reality and there's an absolute and we only... And our consciousness is a fragment of some great, huge cosmic consciousness. I think all that's preposterous. 
Well, what if the spiritual reality were just the disposition to cause experiences like this? <laughs> okay. Yes, but now, exactly. We know the answer to the, what's the disposition. Molecular structure responds in certain ways to nervous systems. The molecular structure of the book in my hand responds to my nervous system in such a way that I know that it's a book because I can see it. And there's no ghost that gets in here. There's no spirit here. It's just that my consciousness is a conscious awareness of the book as the book is causing a certain effect on my nervous system, which eventually produces this intentional presentation of the book. Now, since we're drifting into this area, we might as well get your, your view of the third mistake, your view of consciousness on the table. It's more thoroughly covered in other books, but you have a subsection on it here. I'm so pissed off at the history of philosophy, I'm thinking of writing a book called 10 Outrageous Mistakes in Philosophy and How to Avoid Them. Now, number one big time mistake is to suppose if consciousness is irreducible, which of course it is because nothing's really reducible to something else, if consciousness is irreducible, then it must be in a separate metaphysical realm and you're stuck with dualism. That's mistake number one. Mistake number two is you never actually perceive objects and states of affairs in the world, or at least not directly. You only perceive the contents of your own mind. That's what I call a bad argument. Mistake number three is causation is not a real relation among objects and things in the world. Rather, all there is in the world is a sequence of regular co-occurrences described by scientific laws. And so what makes any causal statement true is that it instantiates a universal law. Now, I could go on with other horrendous mistakes, but that's a, a good start. I mean, mistake number four is the obvious one. It is, well, you can't derive an ought from an is because how things actually are doesn't imply how they ought to be. I don't want to give you all 10 of the horrendous mistakes, but this is a good <laughs> no, start. Let's just, let's we'll stick see. with the couple. So, you know, we've okay. had David Chalmers on, for instance, who, as yeah. you know, has an ontology that finds consciousness irreducible. And therefore, he's stuck with dualism, with all the preposterousness that goes with that. So he's stuck with epiphenomenalism. Nobody in the history of the world ever raised his arm because he was trying to raise his arm. If you get that res result, you know you made a mistake. So Wes, I know in some of our different discussions, you've said stuff like there's a conceptual mistake involved if you, as John does throughout his book, talk about the intention to raise the arm causing the physical movement of the arm. Am I misrepresenting you, Wes? You had objections to that kind of talk. <laughs> there's a puzzle in that there's two levels of explanation there, and we don't need to talk about intentions to explain. All we need is physiology, and all we need is a third-person description of brain states and the body. We don't need any of the subjective experience to explain the raising of the arm. Yeah, I think that's wrong. The, uh, the uh, secretion of acetylcholine is absolutely essential to the movement of the arm. No acetylcholine, no movement. Right. But of course, there's a single event. My intention in action, that's a case of trying, my trying to raise my arm. That single event has one level of description that's phenomenological and another description of the very same event, which involves the secretion of acetylcholine at the axon in plates of the motor neurons. Those are not two separate events. They're a single event described at different levels. In the same way, the explosion in my car engine is described at one level as an explosion, at another level as the oxidization of hydrocarbon molecules. One event, different levels of description. The mistake of these guys like Dave, he's not the worst, but he's a, he makes this mistake, is to suppose that there must be two different events. There's one mental event and one physical event. That's the mistake. So you're an identity theorist, if you want well, to Well, come put on, it for Christ's sake, identity <laughs> theory. I mean, you've listed every dumb mistake in the history of the subject. I mean, if you use expressions like identity theory, you've already expressed the massive confusion. I'm just interested in how the world works. And we know that one of the ways it works is when I raise my arm, there's an event that takes place. And that event has a level of description, which is phenomenological. I was trying to raise my arm and a level of description, which was about the molecular structure of acetylcholine. Now, the problem with the identity theorists is they were trying to get rid of something. I'm not trying to get rid of anything. I'm just trying to describe the fact. I mean, old-time identity theorists, I mean, I'm thinking of guys like uh, Jack Smart and uh, David Armstrong and all those guys. They want to get rid of the mind. I don't want to get rid of the mind. I'm perfectly happy with it. But suppose I said, you know, you could, I think you could be an identity theorist and still say, you know, if I ask the question, what is a sufficient explanation of why someone raises their arm? And then I just, I give the description in terms of acetylcholine. And I leave out any talk about intentions, even though yeah. I believe as an, you know, as an identity theorist that 
There's another description of the same event, which talks about intentions. I'm, the point is, I don't really need to talk about that other description to explain the raising of the arm. Yeah. Try to describe the events of your life on any given day without talking about your intentionality. You can't do it. Even if we knew a whole lot more about the different neurotransmitters, I picked acetylcholine, but that's not the only one involved. Even if we knew a whole lot more, you still have to talk about what you're trying to do, what you're thinking about, and so on. The mistake is that to think when you say that, you're really talking about a different realm, a realm that's other than the ordinary neurobiological realm. But I'm trying to say consciousness is a neurobiological phenomenon. You're making me want to taunt you by just just talking about karma and stuff that I have no, that I don't believe in at all, but just to enrage you more. Uh, but I will resist. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you, you talked to a lot of bad philosophers. Who's karma? <laughs> Hegelian spirit, such that, I, I don't know. So let's re- relate this back to, now we've got a little picture of the mind, back to be a little more specific about your picture of the subjective visual field versus the objective visual field. I don't think we've really clarified quite what that is. Yeah. The objective visual field is the objects and states of affairs that are available to me perceptually from where I'm now sitting. There's an objective visual field. Somebody sitting next to me could see pretty much the objects and states of affairs that I'm seeing. His objective visual field is almost identical with mine. But in addition to that, of course, there is a set of experiences in my head that have the features of the objective visual field as their conditions of satisfaction. So there's no mystery here. It's kind of common sense. To see something, you've got to see it from a point of view. And that point of view, together with the world around you, gives your visual field, the objective visual field. But of course, the way you see it is by having a conscious experience, that is to say, by having a subjective visual field in your head. I mean, I take it that's all kind of common sense. I hope that doesn't sound controversial, because I didn't mean it to sound controversial. Right. Where the details get important, according to your account, because not only is it not something you don't see the subjective visual field, right? It is not the object of experience. The object of yeah. experience is the contents of the, <laughs> the contents of the subjective visual field are supposed to be caused by the objects in the objective visual field, correct? Yeah, is that's that? pretty good. I like that. You pass the exam. Yeah. And the contents are given as having as their conditions of satisfaction that those objects cause those contents. Right. Is that, okay. um, that is to say, from where I sit, for example, I can see the walls of my office with a lot of bookshelves and a lot of pictures on the walls and a big calendar and all that kind of stuff. Now, that's the objective visual field. But, of course, I have access to that by seeing it. That is to say, by having a subjective visual field. The important thing to emphasize is I don't see the subjective visual field because it is the seeing of the objective visual field. Well, do we want to say, as Wes just was, was saying, that the contents of the subjective field represent? You do say represent, but you make sure to say that in the sense of a subspecies of representation, presentation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are, for uh, trivial reasons, you want to define representation as anything that has conditions of satisfaction. It follows that presentations are a subspecies of representations, but that's like saying, you know, humans are a subspecies of animals. But for many purposes, we want to make a distinction between humans and animals. And similarly, for this discussion, it's important to emphasize the special features of presentational intentionality because it's a neglect of those features that's led to the bad argument and basically to the past 300 years of philosophy. Yeah. So the, the contents of the subjective visual field are presentations of the conditions of satisfaction, uh, which is to say of objects and states of affairs. You got it. That's terrific. And, and so to connect these up, the subjective visual field is what being conscious of something is, is to have the subjective visual yeah, field. Is, yeah, except, of course, you can be conscious of the beer in your hand without thinking about the whole rest of the field. The whole field is everything that's uh, available to you from a certain point of view. And the beer in your hand is just one small part of that. And can we say more about how the, the basic visual features get built up into actual objects? Because you're very non-reductionist in a certain way. I don't understand that myself. Oh, okay. uh, it's obvious uh, that you got to get beyond color and shape to get to the fact that this is a Porsche 911 Carrera 4. And now I can see both the color and the shape, and I see that it's a Porsche 911 Carrera 4 Model 993. Now I see all of that. How the hell do I get from one to the other? I don't know. And I'm not sure that that's going to get a philosophical answer. It may have to have a neurobiological or psychological answer. There are a whole lot of empirical issues involved. 
about the nature of memory and the nature of recognition. But can we get a phenomenological answer? Well, the phenomenological answer is, here's the difficulty with the phenomenological answer, is I don't infer that it is a Porsche Carrera 4. I see it. I see literally that it's a Porsche 911 Carrera 4. And that's not a matter of inferring. Uh, and that's raw phenomenology. Now, in a piece of more technical jargon, in the case of phenomenology, the level of the intentionality rises to the level of the background skill. So I can see immediately that it's a certain kind of car, just as if I were a better musician, I could see that this was precisely Beethoven's Third Symphony as played by the NBC Symphony Orchestra under some great conductor. Now, that's a matter of how perception arises to the level of the background ability. But how does that work? Well, that's a tough problem in neurobiology, and I don't know the answer to that. But it sounded like you were committed to the idea in this unconscious thought chapter that to the extent that we, on some level, build the higher level perception out of the lower perception, even though that's not something that we're aware of doing, yeah. it's something that we could call our attention to. That if you say, well, yes, why did you right. think that this was your car, that this was this kind of symphony? Well, you know, refer back to how, well, how the strings are playing or how the uh, particular shape of the fender, yeah. and then you could reduce those further to colors and shapes yeah. and noises. Yeah, well, that's the dream of philosophy. I don't carry that out in this book. I had enough problems already. <laughs> so what did, what did other folks think about this this whole idea of that there can't be the only kind of unconscious thought that it makes sense to talk about is something that at least potentially could be conscious. Maybe Freud is right that there are things that are legitimate thoughts Too painful. Yeah. that get stuck back there. And yeah. certainly there's all the time there are things that as you say, are part of the background, but that you could then turn your attention to them so they're sort of part of the whole experience. Yeah, I think that's right. The problem is uh, to try to ferret it out, and I don't know that the uh, standard introspective methods are going to be adequate. I mean, now we're getting into the area where uh, philosophy builds over into neurobiology, and exactly how is it that the brain enables us to recognize extremely complex phenomena, and yet we do instantly. Uh, when I get home, not only do I recognize my dog, but he recognizes me. Tarski has no problem at all in spotting that it's me, and I have no problem in spotting that it's him. How the hell does that work in the neurobiology? And I don't know. It'd be interesting to know, because there's no, there's no question that I don't look at him the way I look at other dogs, and he doesn't way, look at me the way he looks at other guys. He knows that I'm, I won't say he knows that I'm his boss or his owner, but he knows that I'm a special thing in his life, that, for example, he might get a walk or dinner fairly soon after I arrive. There's another way in which this is interesting and confusing is just the way in which in processing things in the background, you can be surprised by things being different or yeah, be tu yeah, tuned absolutely. into them. So in some ways, you are constantly processing a certain sets of expectations without yeah. having them be conscious expectations in the sense of being in the forefront of your mind or that you've chosen, but that you yeah. you notice something and it surprises you. Yeah. No, uh, you're often surprised by difference. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, and that difference presumes that you had a expectation of the way it was supposed to be in the first place. Yeah, you had an expectation of the habitual, and it turns out to be it's not the habitual. Absolutely. But as Wittgenstein kept reminding us, expectation isn't the name of a certain kind of feeling. It's not an introspective process. Exactly. Yeah. So I was one of those guys that was starting on the cognitive science track in the early mid-90s that you criticize. I didn't follow through with that, but I, I see the, you know, if you're trying to think, well, how do we build the uh, full objects out of basic perceptual pieces? Yeah. One of the ways that a philosopher or a philosopher slash psychologist might try to do that is by giving some sort of schematic to say, you know, well, we run through the choice. It's sort of like you're going to program a computer to do this thing. So what are the steps that it would take? That while you don't object to that as a way of potentially understanding, potentially giving you a clue to the neurobiology, the, the big objection just seems to be that you, you can't think of that as, as unconscious thought in any sense, that sort of schematic picture. That for something to be a thought, it has to be a thought under an aspect. It has right. to have... Yeah. has to have a spectral shape. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and the way you characterized that in the book was that what's the difference between thinking something is water and thinking that it's H2O? Those yeah. are two aspects of the same thing. It's the sense and reference distinction once again. And if you're thinking of unconscious thought as being a schematic in this way, then that does not make those distinctions between different senses of the same information. Yeah, 
No, that sounds right to me. Uh, that um, uh, the unconscious, if it's to be meaningful, has to be at least potentially conscious. And there are a whole lot of things that I perceive by way of using unconscious cues. Uh, that is to say, cues that I'm not conscious of. Uh, but all the same, we have to be able to unpack all of that in terms of my actual experience. However, uh, this is a tough question that I don't address in the book. How to get from the basic perceptual features and the basic perceptual experience to complex higher level case of recognition. And my guess is that we won't be able to answer that solely philosophically. You're going to have to have a whole lot of empirical evidence about the brain and of psychological evidence about mental processing. Let me ask you one more here. All uh, right, I, one more. <laughs> all right. You recognize some distinction between primary and secondary qualities, for instance. Yeah. The thing about color is that it really is just defined, perhaps, the, the feature in the world that causes this kind of thing in us. Yeah, it's well, that's not, at least part of it. So I, can you go further than that and say, it's a, it seemed like you could, I know you have a whole other book on this that I haven't read about, about uh, things like money and cultural creations, but can you, yeah. so if we, if we get to somebody like Jean-Paul Sartre, who, who sees not only that Kant is wrong, that we can't get at things in themselves, in fact, the entire world, all consciousness is, is just straight up openness to the world. And what that gives him is some crazy views, like that emotional components, for instance, something's being dreadful, is objectively in the world, according yeah, to him. He's uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but can't you give, it seems like your view admits something like that, well, you know, this sort of situation is defined by the, the fact that it causes this kind of reaction in me and others well, there are lots of different phenomena. We live in one world, and one of the questions that interests me is how can there be these objective features of the world like money and property and government and marriage, which are what they are only because we think that's what they are. And I've written two books about that, not one, uh, The Construction of Social Reality and Making the Social World. And I think those are fascinating questions. But what's wrong with South is uh, basic to this whole enterprise is you have to distinguish between those features of the world whose existence is observer relative, like money and private property and being president of the United States, and those whose feature is observer independent, uh, such as force, mass, and gravitational attraction. Uh, so I want a basic distinction between those features of the world that require a perceiver and those that don't. I require an attitude on the part of some conscious agent and those that don't. And I think South is missing that. By the way, it's characteristic of idealism that they miss this, and a lot of phenomenologists miss it. They miss the fact, they get from the fact that, well, it just looks dreadful. They think dreadfulness must be a, an observer-independent feature of the world. That's wrong. So, yes, the way you characterize this is that it's ontologically objective and ontologically subjective. Exactly, correct? yes, right. And all observer relative features have an element of ontological subjectivity. But this doesn't prevent us from having an epistemically objective account. So money is only money because we think it's money, but we can still have an epistemically objective account. It's a plain fact that I have a $20 bill in my pocket. Yeah, no, I thought that if just that little distinction between the ontologically objective and subjective and the epistemologically objective and subjective, yeah. that's worth the price of admission alone. Well, thanks a lot. I don't know why the hell did nobody <laughs> make that distinction. It's screamingly obvious. I shouldn't have to wait for me to make that distinction. But anyway, you're absolutely right. I think that distinction is crucial. And it's very important because a lot of people used to tell me, well, science is objective, but consciousness is subjective, so you can't have a science of consciousness. That's a fallacy of ambiguity. Science is indeed epistemically objective, but that doesn't prevent you from having an epistemically objective account of a domain that is ontologically subjective, the domain of consciousness. It's an obvious point. Hey, my freshmen get this without any problem. So you're going to lay claim to the name for your philosophy of objectivism to take it back from Ayn Rand? Oh, uh, yeah. God, I, listen, I wish I had a list of all the bad, confused people you've mentioned. It was bad enough when you got to South. And I've never read Karma. But anyway, let's not, I mean, let's, you, I, before I have to wash your mouth out, well, that's, that's enough. Well, thank you so much for your time. This is, thank uh, you for coming on, Highly John. entertaining. Thanks for coming on. Okay, well, thanks a lot. This was fun. Hey, so that's just the, the first half of the discussion. We're going to have some more discussion without John. So if, if some of this went too fast, you can hear it all a little more slowed down. We'll, we'll get more into our own views. We'll try to make those comparisons that I was <laughs> trying to throw out to Hegel and other folks like that insofar as we feel up to doing so. So that interview was a heck of a lot of fun. Do you feel like he, uh, it was difficult in terms of having the space and relaxation to 
articulate a view that you're not sure that you know how to articulate. And, uh, you know, the way that we do on this show, I think it's perhaps useful that we have a second half that we can, uh, take a little more time with it <laughs> without having him shout us down for <laughs> wanting to wash my mouth out. He's earned it after, at 84, after 83, decades. 84. Of, yeah. Yeah. Well, w- decades of doing this, you get cranky with all the wrong people out there. <laughs> I liked his crankiness in that I thought he was very articulate about it. He wasn't sputtering about it. He did say a version of, it's just a bunch of malarkey. I just can't understand. It's almost unfathomable how all these really smart guys were so stupid about this. <laughs> but he's articulate about his objections. He happens to be wrong about, <laughs> in my view. Well, and we've been critical in the past. I think the comparison to Ayn Rand is directly on point because they had a similar fury about Kant and all the post-Kantians for not the same political reason, obviously, but the same epistemological intuition that, no, of course, come on, of course we have access to the the world directly, and therefore science works in a pretty straightforward way, and there's no room for all this malarkey about religion. That's something that Searle and Ayn Rand very much have in common. Well, as as Searle, you know, admitted, he hasn't carefully read all of these figures, especially the German idealists. It's more of a reaction to the general idea of what these guys represent. It's not a close reading of Descartes and Kant and Hegel and then a systematic rejection or correction of those views. It's a more general zeitgeist of what they represent that he's rejecting. Well, and it's also he's concerned, all the examples that we talked about were specific perceptions of physical objects. The discussion of Hegel was all about these very high-level abstractions, and that was following very much in the tradition of Aristotle, who himself was giving us a version of idealism where we get, there's the noose, there's mind in itself, apart from my mind, apart from your mind, but that we only end up thinking as the noose when we are thinking about these universal things. So another way to say that is kind of like when you talk about math, just like Frege says it, when you talk about math, when you talk about logic, you don't actually have to talk about the habits of individual minds. You can just talk about the subject matter. That's, to me, the essence of why you would want to talk about noose or something like that is because you're no longer concerned with individual psychology. You could talk about thought in some broader sense as Frege does. And, you know, we weren't talking in this discussion except at the very end where I brought up his books on money and society and politics and stuff that I really want to read now. (laughs) But I don't think they would actually do much in the direction I'm thinking here. You know, we were not talking about abstractions at all. And maybe there is something to be said that when you are discussing something that's more abstract than red or this particular instance of red, then there might be some sense of talking about spirit or noose or something. What are you trying to get at? I'm just trying to recreate some of our discussion about this in Hegel. Let's talk about justice or money or any other abstract idea. I mean, I thought that's what he was covering at the end, something that was ontologically subjective. Right. It only exists because people think about it. So this is a book about perception, right? Not about the thinkable. What are we talking about news? What about talking about justice or abstract ideas makes you want to talk about news. I'm kind of asking the question, does it make more sense to feel that there is a need to talk about different perspectives in a wider... Sorry, I'm just trying to compose what the question I have in my head here. Well, I mean, what do you think? Why, why would idealism be seductive at all? I tried to say it during the first half, but it's seductive because we seem to have a mediated access to the world. I don't buy his account of the traditional epistemologists, that they somehow thought we can perceive only our own representations, and therefore we have this distance from the world, we have to explain how it is we can know things. If they use the word, we perceive our representations, they're only using that equivocally. It can't be the same as perception in our everyday sense of perception of the world. Because like I said, all the same epistemological problems would just re-arise within that scheme. What they need is the same sort of having awareness of that's immediate, that's non-intentional in this other sense that Searle was describing. But the seductiveness of it is just this idea that we want to say, all, all of this is motivated by saying, we want to say we have knowledge of the world. And knowledge mm-hmm. is something that has to put us in touch with 
mind independent objects. They have there has to be some sort of mind independence to them for the knowledge to be objective. But on the other hand, there has to be some mind dependence because it's a relational thing between our minds and the world. And traditionally, philosophers have been confused about how you can preserve both mind independence and mind dependence, how you get those two things to work together so that we have objective knowledge of the world and yet account for the fact that that comes through our minds. You know, you were just mentioning Hegel. His solution is to say, we got to move back to some stuff that comes before even the subject-object distinction. Let's stop starting from the standpoint of, you know, a subject-object distinction. So, he, you know, he's going to give his own version in a way of direct realism. It's not one apparently that Searle likes, but it's quite, <laughs> it's motivated and, and structurally similar in some ways. So, but anyway, I think that's how you explain the motivation for for idealism. And idealism can mean, of course, different things. And the idealist gets sort of a picture which, again, is in some ways similar to Searle's because within that little constructed mind realm, you have direct access to objects, you know, Barclay. Yes. And so, like I said, they're giving up the thing in itself in order to get that direct access. And Searle's rejoinder is, look, you can have both. You can have both the thing in itself and this directness. But that's a puzzle. But that's Barclay's view as well, is you end up, it's just he wants to call the thing in itself an idea, and maybe there's no sensible reason to do that. That's kind of what I was getting. Well, why would you want to call it that? Well, if you're Hegel, you would want to call the thing in itself an idea because it's knowable conceptually. Yeah, but it's the same for Barclay. We want to call these objects ideas because we want to give them the property of knowability, and it seems like that's the only way to do it, is to call them ideas. They have to be knowable. So the knowable things are the ideas. Yeah, I understand that, but but in the case of Barclay, there are reasons why he sounds like he's such a fruitcake, is that his approach to that is that, you know, I don't have access to the world, right? I have access to ideas, and there's some way in which the, the idea, ideas are the world, yeah. So we do have access to the world. So someone might come along and say, look, you're just using a different word. Why not just call it matter? And Barclay actually addresses that. He goes on at length about why, well, why not just say everything is matter then? And again, it comes down to the fact that when we call something matter, we sort of have subtracted mind from it, and we can't do that on his view. So in the same way, and I guess this is why Searle doesn't want to call himself not only not an idealist, but he doesn't want to call himself a materialist. He doesn't want to call himself an identity theorist. He just thinks that these conceptual schemes that give rise to this kind of talk are too screwed up in the first place. And another interview I heard him talk about, it's like, well, you know, haven't other philosophers in the past, like Heidegger, tried to come up with new language that avoids this subject? Because the problem it does seem to be well, is, there, is his problem the subject-object distinction? No, I think he embraces that by talking about the subjective realm and the objective. So he's going to embrace that distinction and yet find a way to join. And again, I really actually do think his solution is ingenious, but we'll get to that. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a different sort of approach to try and yeah move back to the moment before the subject-object distinction. Well, I think I not only perceive causality, but I perceive karma. I perceive that that <laughs> happened to you because you're a bastard. <laughs> Yes, the philosopher Karma. <laughs> karma, he, he, I think he was a chameleon. He comes and goes. His theory is that you deserve what you get. So what else did we get out of that? So he, he gave his little thing about biological naturalism. I know we didn't read more than that one little chapter about his philosophy of mind, but he gives it pretty well. Pretty much that there's a problem in the relation between mind and matter, but it's just, and this seems right to me, that there are different levels of description of the same phenomena. So he is an identity theorist in that sense. It was not clear whether he was a type type identity theorist or a token token identity theorist. In other words, is it So let me let me just throw the jargon card because I have no idea what identity theorist means. And token token and yeah. Let me just explain it then. I wanted to situate him in this if you say that each experience of a belief or a desire is identical to a particular brain state, then you're an identity theorist. And so he is. It's the difference between the two is if you're a type type identity theorist, then you might say each pain is C fibers firing and it's a particular type. But you might want to say there are different neurological things that could result in the experience of pain. 
So that could be C fibers firing or it could be this other thing going on. So maybe in that case, you're either just, well, giving a more extensive version of the type, but you're at least saying on a token token basis, when any particular occurrence of a pain or any other mental content, then there is some physical thing that is going on underlying it that is the same. Now there's the question of like, well, what is the same? And he seemed to jump at, the only reason somebody would want to be an identity theorist is because you're a reductionist, because you want to get rid of the mental talk and say, once science is advanced enough that we know that pain is C fibers firing, we will just even stop using the word pain. Or if we do, we'll just say, oh, that's just folk psychology. We'll just retain that. I don't think he would buy that, though. I don't think. No, no, he's, he, he definitely does not. He thinks he was, he was arguing against the situation you were putting forward, Wes, where, where that's what's going on, where you're just giving a neurological account by saying, no, yeah. you'll always need the mental talk. And I can see that from a social perspective. I don't know. It just seems like the physical talk would be too complicated. So it would just take too long to say anything. It's just like, should we say this in binary or should we say it in? It doesn't convey the same information, but I, I don't want to, do we really want to have our philosophy of mind debate? <laughs> I just wanted to bring it in insofar as we brought it in last time. And how does that affect what he had to say about perception and whether you buy it or not? I mean, I actually like his, I mean, I was a big fan, always a big fan of his take on consciousness. You know, especially mm-hmm. the Chinese room argument, which I think it's very illustrative, right? So let's um, give it quickly. I know we, we have a whole other episode on it. It's symbol manipulation never amounts to consciousness. So if you think of it in a, on a linguistic analogy, syntax can never give a rise to semantics. So if you have a language, the rules of the ordering and the structure of that language can never spontaneously give rise to a semantics where one word has one meaning and another word has another. And there's an analogy there to brain processes where you think of the brain functions as syntax and the puzzle, the mind-body problem, is how syntax there spontaneously gives a rise to its own semantics. The Chinese room argument is just a bunch of people in a room that have a rule book of when you receive this kind of symbol, output this kind of symbol. The symbols that they're receiving are Chinese characters. And so... You feed a Chinese characters and the bunch of people in the room, or maybe it's just one person, end up able by following the rule book to give back responses that somebody on the outside thinks that this room is actually speaking Chinese. Yet clearly nobody in the room understands Chinese. So there was a question, well, does the right. system as a whole understand Chinese? And you know, no, he doesn't right. buy that. So the implication of functionalism is that you could just, as long as you have the right patterns and functions and operations you could have consciousness and that could even be there's you know there's talk of by some philosophers of suppose you had everyone in china become cogs in a machine where they're behaving in certain ways that it replicates certain brain functions and does the population of china become suddenly its own collectively a conscious entity that's sort of some of the weird implications of functionalism and I think they tried that with the <laughs> Olympic Games opening ceremonies. Oh, God. So I brought that up just because those sorts of insights are really, I think, crucial in the, the history of the philosophy of mind. But I think he's in a minority. His idea is that it's, so it's not just the patterning and the, the functions of the, of the brain that make it conscious, but there's something about the biological substrate itself. There's some property of that little gelatinous thing that contributes to its consciousness, which is not to say that you couldn't have some other substrate. It's just that that substrate, too, would have to have these special properties that give rise to consciousness. It's not enough for the substrate to be arranged in the right way and to function in the right way. It's a little bit like saying that something about the biology makes us self-active beings. It's nominally... Aristotle in that respect, right? It's just a distinction for biological creatures that they're conscious. And that's just part of what they are. Right. And it's not a philosophical question yeah. how that happens. It's a scientific neurological question. And that we have consciousness the way we have four limbs. Yeah, I, I don't agree that the problem of consciousness is just simply a scientific question. And I don't, you know, Searle acknowledges the mind-body problem. And he seems to acknowledge in places that it's intractable. 
But then he says these things in place as well. He wants to embrace naturalism and seems to say there is no problem. So it's unclear even within his own writing what his view on this is. It's contradictory, I think. I think it has a parallel in the account of perception. You know, what makes something red? Well, it makes something red because it's the kind of thing that makes us see red. Sure. (laughs) There's something lacking as an illustrative explanation. It's weird. So I call that ingenious, but I also think it's weird. It's something that requires a lot more thought. Well, but say to me a little bit what's lacking in it, right? So we say, how does consciousness put us in touch with the things themselves? This is the way I like to think of the question. And then you tell me, well, it puts us in touch with the things themselves because the things themselves are just dispositions to cause certain types of experiences And experiences are fundamentally attributions of causality to certain subjective, qualitative feelings of things. Or perceptions. Well, they're attributions through the subjective, qualitative, but they're attributions to the objective, right? Yeah, you know, so the fundamental, the intentional aspect of experience is to, you know, you have a certain phenomenology to it, what he calls a phenomenology, there's a feel to it, and then I attribute a causality to that feel, to some object That's causing it. And so those are the two aspects, the two really important aspects of that experience, the the qualitative feel of it, and then the attribution of causality. And then so the question is, well, what is that having an awareness of an experience, the having of the experience, not, you know, not the perception of a representation, which he rejects, but simply Mm -hmm. the having of an experience. How does that get me in touch with the object? How does the intentionality actually hook me up to the object that's causing the experience? And Well, I thought that was how intentionality is working in the first place. But he wants to explain intentionality. He wants to reduce it to this non-intentional internal relation between experience and the world. He wants to say why there's intentionality, essentially. And his answer is the reason why that can be intentional is because when I have that qualitative feel and represent it as caused by the object, the object that my intention reaches out towards, its nature is to be the kind of thing that causes that kind of experience. And so that gives me the direct contact because my ascription of causality matches up precisely with its being a causer. I don't know how to explain it better than that. but No, that sounds like his explanation. So I'm feeling a little guilty about our glib use of intentionality, that I know that we explained it, we tried to explain it during the discussion with Searle, but we've had so many discussions of it within our episodes, and it always means something slightly different that maybe we should back up and kind of say what that is, that the intentionality is just the aboutness of a mental state, or even a sentence, his whole book, Intentionality, is primarily not about perception, it's about beliefs, it's about sentences. It's about propositions. Right. It's a minority position in the philosophical world to think of perception as intentional. But the minority position is what we've talked about most, which started with maybe Brentano or somebody, but it definitely was in Husserl and other folks like that, which is every mental act, a perception, a belief, maybe not everyone, you might have like just dread, not of anything in particular, but usually it's of something. And so what do you call that something? You could call it the intentional object, the intentional content. With Husserl, it was the act is the noesis, and the object is the noema, just to throw out some obnoxious terms like that. In some ways, you might say it's indivisible, that the intentional act is, this is why Husserl uses those terms. It's just the kind of poles of it. But it's really one thing. You can't think of... With Husserl, the intentional objects are abstract, right? The answer is uh, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Some of them, I thought. Uh, because the phenomena are always these partial experiences of the object, right? We have this temporal sequence of different aspects of the object, and the intentional object itself is the object, and so it has to be abstract on this view. Ah, okay, yeah. But the example he gives, so on page 14, and he gives a pretty cursory description of it, but it's, you know, the mind is directed at, about, of objects or states of affairs in the world, whether it's hunger, thirst, beliefs, perceptions, intentions, desires. They have that directedness towards the world. And so, When we talk about conditions of satisfaction, so he says the content of the intentional state determines its conditions of satisfaction. So which is to say the content of the belief that it is raining is satisfied if and only if it is raining. So the conditions of satisfaction are the objects or states of affairs. And I represent those conditions to myself, you know, in this case with a belief. I say, hey, it's raining. And I represent The condition of satisfaction, meaning my belief that it's raining is only going to be true 
if in fact it's raining. So that gets us at some of that jargon. So the intentionality there is this sense in which, in the case of beliefs, the truth or falsity of the intentional state depends on the world outside of us. And just the fact that you're putting it as that an intentional state has a truth or falsity is in line with the way Searle talks about it, which is that actually you don't just have an intentional object. In other words, I perceive the fish. Yeah. It's always, I perceive that the fish is here. Yes. Yeah. So it's always a state of affairs, really, that you're trying to connect up to. I thought he was trying to articulate Searle's view. Yeah, because he wants to say with perception, he wants to solve the problem of hallucination and illusion by saying that we can have an intentional content, but mm -hmm. that fails to... Have its conditions of satisfaction satisfied. Yeah. So this has puzzled philosophers for a long time because there was the belief that, you know, an intentional state must have an object of some kind, even if it's a non-existent object, you know, even when we're hallucinating. Or in fact, you would have these discussions about if I'm imagining a unicorn, the unicorn doesn't really exist, but because I'm imagining it, there must be a way in which it exists in some fashion. Right. It exists as an idea. It subsists. But also it just, you, we can put it in this realm of abstract entities. When we hallucinate, we have content without the satisfaction. <laughs> or even when we don't hallucinate, right? Like in the case of the unicorn, we just make up a story, right? Any kind of fictional story would be in that realm, right? Where you have content that the conditions of satisfaction are never met, right? I was thinking specifically of perception. Yeah, so there would be maybe a different discussion to have. So he would reject the notion that when I read Harry Potter that I'm having perceptions. Right. Yeah, right. Or maybe we could ask how he would talk about that, because I'm going to have something playing through my mind. I'm going to have images. I'm going to be having thoughts and thinking about it. But he's not going to consider those perceptions in a conventional way. And this is, might be you know, another way of articulating why you would have something like the bad argument or have confusion about this, is that we have thoughts about the world that are very much like the kinds of things that we engage in when we're interacting with the world, right? Now, he contends that they're just simply not the same. Whatever I'm imagining when I'm reading Harry Potter, it is not the same thing as if I were Harry Potter interacting with the world. Let's pick something that was true. It was a documentary. My reading a book about being in Syria is not the same thing as being in Syria. Even if you have a very vivid exactly. imagination, yes. and the account of that is because... In the imagining case, it doesn't have intentional causality. You perceive it as something that you are generating the image of, not that the being in Syria is generating that That's image. That's right. Right. Imagination lacks key features of intentionality. Yes. In particular, the self-reflexive causality. Yeah. Say what the self-reflexive part is. That's the first time we've uttered that term here. That just means that it is assigning the causality to the object. So when I see the ball rolling down the street, I have expectations about that. Yeah. So part of my intention is not just that I say to myself, oh, there's a ball rolling down the street. Part of the intention is to say to myself, and that ball rolling down the street is causing this experience. So that if there actually isn't a ball rolling down the street, then the intention isn't satisfied. Yeah. I was going down the road of predicting something about its motion and stuff like that. But Wes, you're right, that that's the self-reflexive part has to do with that that red ball is the thing that's causing my experience. Right, and there has to be a, a hookup with the actual content and the object that it's about in the right way. So that he says, even if you had, let's say, you're really a brain in a vat, but a ball rolling down the street hits your vat and causes, by bouncing your brain in your vat, somehow that causes the experience of seeing a ball rolling down the street. That's not in the right way. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But even if we just took the straight up brain in a vat case, your brain was stimulated in such a way that you had all of the neurochemical experiences of seeing a ball rolling down the street. He would say that you had that ontologically subjective experience, but that it didn't match up with the world because it didn't actually happen. And so you were just wrong. But yet he has to say that somehow, that it's not that you had the representation of a ball and it just so happened that, that it wasn't instantiated. He has to somehow say... It doesn't meet the conditions of satisfaction. You're grasping at the... 
This is the really frustrating thing throughout this whole book is he wants to say there's no intermediary between you and the world. And he actually gives, we did not talk about this. He at one point talks about one of the characteristics of these disjunctivists. He has a whole chapter about these disjunctivists, some of his contemporaries who Alva Noe is one of them. That is a name that we hear thrown around a lot that are sort of more thorough direct realists than he right. is. <laughs> and this is like what we said about Sartre is that all perception is, is an openness to the world. That the object is actually literally part of the experience. Yeah. Yes, not incidentally. I've been thinking about us reading William James' essays in Radical Empiricism, and, and that is exactly that view back in 1910 or something. But he criticizes the disjunctivists because they they reject the notion that you can actually have a hallucination that is the same as the actual experience. Mm -hmm. And so their take on the problem that he's addressing is that there really is no proper identity between a brain in a vat and experiencing the real world, that you could always make that distinction. Searle doesn't want to grant that. He wants to grant that the experiences of your brain in the vat would be subjectively equivalent. Mm -hmm. And that the way that you distinguish them is not... Well, in fact, in a way, we didn't get into a discussion about this question of judging the conditions of satisfaction because at some point there, that's going to happen right and so you are going to say okay we know that it's veridical if it meets the conditions of satisfaction and there's this, this sort of open question about the process of meeting those conditions in other words you could always be wrong yes yes exactly you could always be wrong in the case i, I think that's what he would say about the brain in the vat case right yep is that you just don't have any way of knowing <laughs> exactly Whereas a lot of these guys want to say, by definition, so for instance, as a pragmatic point, if we are brains and vats, if we are in the matrix, whatever, if that's what reality is, as long as it exhibits the appropriate characteristics of reality, in other words, you can't like in the matrix bend spoons <laughs> or whatever, whatever, you can't bend reality, you can't cheat, you can't tweak the code, then that's what reality is by definition. The Matrix is a great example of this, right? Because in The Matrix, most of the entities in The Matrix don't have any understanding that they are in a Matrix, right? And it's only through certain kinds of deviations that identify that you are in it. And, you know, Neo eventually is both made aware of it by someone clarifying for him some weird senses that he had earlier, which we don't, we aren't really privy to in the story. And then, it becomes very clear to him that there is this distinction between the matrix and not the matrix by being able to see signs of it and manipulate it and stuff like that. Which sounds to me very much like that account of it, Searle would be perfectly fine with. To the extent that you figure out that you are a brain in a vat requires that there be events that allow you to make that distinction. And otherwise, you don't have any way of making the distinction. It's just not possible. And that would be true about anything in the world, right? The only way that you know whether something is true is having it satisfy conditions of satisfaction. And that, in fact, it could be that those conditions of satisfaction are met in a way by there being a completely different... They seem to be satisfied, but they're not. But they're not, yes. Because the Matrix, because this is all conceivable, because he doesn't rule it out, then it does seem... He's giving a kind of pragmatism. He's saying that... Exactly. It's exactly right. Our practices assume the existence of an objective world. Yep. And so unless there's a strong reason to go against that, <laughs> well, I, yep. then that's what we should believe. Well, and in fact, he's deeply pragmatic in this respect. And it seemed to be the same thing. You know, we were pointing out how he's giving a version of aspectualism. He's saying we see something that is true about objects, something that is true of the things in themselves, but maybe it's not the whole truth. And of course, in a trivial sense, it's never the whole truth, even if, you know, the ultimate constituents are atoms. There's not even subatomic particles, atoms. And maybe we even have microscopes that can detect the atoms. Even then, because just the sheer number of atoms, we wouldn't know all the details. But that's not the point we're making. There could be a whole realms of explanation that we just aren't thinking about and couldn't possibly think about. And they're way beyond anything that we could possibly even imagine because, you know, reality is not actually three dimensional or four is not actually space time structured that way. That's something that's introduced by our perceptual faculties for Kant. And so what's really important, I was trying to just bring in something like the Vedic view, you know, that the world is the veil of Maya. It's all illusion. 
because Wes brought up Schopenhauer, who shares this. And so that, yes, you could do science, you could have objectivity, you could have all that. But even though your perceptions are getting at some aspect of reality, it's not getting at the most important ones. But according to Searle, at least, pragmatic considerations, you know, and I agree with this. I don't think that we have a reason to think that really everything is an illusion and Buddhism is right and we're all subject to the veil of Maya. I just don't. I don't find that motivating. And I think that's kind of where he's coming from, that he's... Yeah, but but Schopenhauer, you know, says we have direct access to the things in themselves through causality. <laughs> it's a very similar picture in its broad brushstrokes. Yeah, I would have to go back to Schopenhauer to try to line up that part of Schopenhauer with the world of illusion, you know, sort of the tip of the iceberg. Well, can I can I just give a brief... Yeah, please do. I just don't remember it. So Searle, in quite a few places, says, look, the best way to understand our experience of objects via intentionality is to look at the other side of the coin where we have actions caused by our intentions. And then to look at that, you know, what he calls the world to mind fit there and see that as reversed in the case of experience where the mind is fitting to the world. And Schopenhauer does the same thing. He says, look, what we know best is causality through our own will. We know it because when we will things, when we intend things, we have direct access to that. And each action, right, there are two sides to it. One is the representational side of the moving of my body, and the other is the subjective side of having that intention. And that's the loophole that gets us access to things in themselves, the things in themselves behind the representations. Because what we can do is we can identify, because everything out there, all representation is just a manifestation of the internal striving of things. It's the manifestation of their causal intentionality, let's say, in a broad sense. And so the reason why we can have direct access to them is just because as willing beings, we get direct access to all those willings outside of us. So now compare Searle's position in which the thing that gets us access to the object is the fact that the object consists of the disposition to cause. Almost like the willing or striving in Schopenhauer consists of the disposition to cause, and we can represent it as cause to us. So in other words, we don't need to get into all this fancy stuff about, oh, here's a representation, and it pictures the object, and we have to figure out how it freaking pictures the object. It's a mess. It's so much simpler to say all we need is to say, oh, here's my qualitative feel. What makes it connect with the world is not that that qualitative experience is like the world, but simply that I say that that qualitative feel is caused by the world, and the world just is the disposition to cause that kind of qualitative feel. If that's not Schopenhauerian. <laughs> the way you described Schopenhauer's account of how we know causation because it's our action actually Searle has exactly Exactly. that same thing. I followed his directive. The book was mostly self-contained, but he makes several references. I didn't quite get this intentional causation stuff. And so I do own the 1983 book, Intentionality, and read a good chunk of chapter four on intentional causation. And I'm not cheating here by going beyond, but I'm just confirming what you just said, which is that whether or not this is how we learn about causation, that's not really the point. It's how could we justify our belief in causation? That he was saying that Hume is so wrong. In fact, every perception that we have is causally laden. And he sees perception throughout the book that we read. Perception and intention in action, is what he calls it, are kind of two sides of the same coin. That the only difference is one has a mind-to-world fit. In other words, I'm trying to make my perception accurately reflect the Mm -hmm. world. And one has a world to mind fit. In other words, I want to do something. I want something to happen. And so I'm trying to make the world accord to my intention Mm -hmm. that I already have. And that's confusing because intention in that way means what it normally does to a Mm non-philosopher, meaning to do something. But he thinks those two things are connected. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, that intentions in the ordinary sense, motivations are just one species of intentionality broadly directed. Well, in other words, an intention in the typical sense is this, you know, I'm going to make the world satisfy this conception, right? By I conceive of it and I'm going to do it. I'm going to transform the world into Mm -hmm. to make it fit this intention. And then our experience of objects is just the reverse of that. You know, the object causes me to have the intention that it satisfies something like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah it, it causes that picture of the world for you. And built into the notion of 
self-motivated causality. I don't know a good way to intention sub A, in other words, the ordinary version <laughs> of causality. I intend to do something built into that is a notion of causality just between things in the world, even that don't involve me. Because if I want to break this vase with this hammer, that's something that I can experience. Then part of that is, yes, my experience of my will as moving mm-hmm. the hammer and my will is causing the vase ultimately to break. But it also is a perception of the interaction between the hammer and the vase. Even, you know, after I've sort of done my thing, maybe I drop the hammer and what does it do to the vase? So that's enough to get it going to then have the idea of causality inhabits the whole world. I know that causality outside of me is real because I have this internal window into causality through my own causally directed intentional behaviors. But wasn't it weirder in Schopenhauer that it's like we have to be empathetic to what it's like to be the vase or what it's like to be the hammer, whereas Searles does not have that issue. It's not so weird. Well, and he also puts it in the language of willing, right? And so you end up having every entity or proto-entity or whatever has its own activity in which it's willing things. (laughs) And that sounds weird. The idea still is, though, that my direct access to the world is access to the causality of things. And I think that is quite similar between Schopenhauer and Searle. I think you're right. And in fact, you see it in the intentionality of what Mark said of trying to break the vase. But then you also have the world reflecting back on you, particularly when your intentionality is retuned by the world. So you grab a hammer to go to break the vase, but it turns out the vase is actually made of concrete and the hammer bounces off of it and smacks you in the head, right? And so the world is re-educating your your intention. Mm. Anything else that struck you from the book? I really enjoyed the book, and he followed through with his theory of perception in the middle. I think that I would have liked to have spent more time on him resolving or talking about some of these conditions of satisfaction questions, which I think are close to the root of why you would have the bad argument and why you would have a lot of the things that he just dismisses as crazy town in philosophy have to do with trying to address questions like not just illusion, but making mistakes, making revisions, having conditions of satisfaction, and then finding out that those were the wrong conditions of satisfaction. The whole process of figuring things out that give rise to a a notion of mediatedness, that we look at the world through a lens of thoughts and conceptions that are the background. And so, I mean, he talks about that. In some ways, he addresses a whole host of really interesting pieces, but one of the next book too, because I think that some of the really hard questions, which he admits are hard questions, he doesn't spend as much time with. I was trying to find uh, reviews of this online. Yeah, I looked them up too. And like, for instance, one of them just was calling into question this terminology that he comes up with of the subjective visual field versus the objective visual field. I kind of like it, but there's something a little weird about it, and it would be strange if, of all the many philosophers that have thought of this throughout history, (laughs) that he's the only one that came up with this sort of solution. That's why I just see his solution as one of many variations that we've seen in the literature of, yes, of course, there's some intermediary between you and the things. It's just that his intermediary... He wants to be very careful that it's not really an intermediary. It's an activity. It's a doing. But at the same time, he criticizes more thoroughgoing direct realists who, in giving an account of the ontology of the situation, will just say, well, there's me and there's the things that I'm perceiving. Because you need in the ontology there the perception itself. You know, he he accuses these people of denying that consciousness even exists. If they say, well, what perception really is, is something that physically includes the object. In other words, what perception is, is just like when we talk about money, we're kind of stating a social fiction. We're we're stating something that is not actually coextensive. It's not token-token equivalent with a brain state. That talking about a perception is actually not talking about a psychological thing, strictly speaking, at all. It's talking about a social phenomena, something that is a relation between you and things. And just Searle has no tolerance for that. It just makes me want to read one of those guys like Alva Noe or something to see really what this kind of view looks like. Because like Ayn Rand, (laughs) Searle is so dismissive of his many opponents. You know, just his characterization of the whole history of philosophy is making this very fundamental mistake. 
you know, either they're denying consciousness exists. That's not the bad mistake. This is the other thing I was referring to or the bad mistake, the, the bad argument, the bad argument that all we know is our own minds. No, as you were saying, Wes, that's not a appropriate characterization probably of most of the people that for reasons of the argument of illusion think that there have to be some intermediary between you and things. Right. They just want to say experience is mediated. Kant, in a sense, says all you know is your own mind. Not Descartes, right? Descartes says you know objects outside of you and so on. They're grounding it in different ways, that's all. He's performing the same sort of task. He just doesn't want to do it with representation, with typical correspondence theory of truth or something like that. I was a little put off by all the glib rejections of the history of philosophy, but his solution, I think, is actually unique as far as I know. I mean, it's not typical direct realism. It's, Mark, as you were saying, that these more radical direct realists would probably see him as just another guy who's trying to say there's this intermediary between us and the objects. The only figure I see that's actually really similar to it is Schopenhauer. As far as I can tell, it's really innovative, and it, it's something I want to give a lot more thought to. And again, there's this question for me that I'm having a lot of trouble articulating that clearly he has multiple books on these higher level, more abstract social things. But I get the feeling, like when we read the hermeneutics, Gadamer and them talking about hermeneutics, and all that came right out of people like Nietzsche, which came out of kind of like Schopenhauer. And those guys, they seem to have things that would socially affect your point of view, you know, my distinguishing this from that in a different way than you might, <laughs> the background knowledge that comes to that, that there's epistemological significance to that in a way that's hard for me to capture through Searle's picture of, oh, well, it's just the kind of thing that causes that kind of perception. And he admits that this is a hole in his own account in that he says, of course, I perceive this as this kind of Porsche that is my car, <laughs> Not just as red outline and then somehow in my conscious mind I build up. No, no. He's a gestalt guy in terms of we experience complex holes. But but he can't relate those complex holes himself to the basic intentional causality. That you, you say, every time I see a Porsche, it's because I'm just assuming that the kind of object that is causing this is the kind that makes me think it's a Porsche. <laughs> Can you do that with complex stuff? Can you still do the formula? Well, I think you have to reduce it, don't you? You have to analyze it into the more basic perceptions. I'm not sure. Like, it seems like he says both in different places that in some sense, yes, to explain why you could be wrong that it's a Porsche, then you'd have to say, well, no, I did experience, you know, the outline and the colors and stuff. It's just I had an independent categorization in my head from past experiences that I wasn't applying correctly or something like that. This is sort of the higher level stuff that when Kant or somebody does epistemology, Yes, you talk about the sensations, but then you also talk about applying these overall categories. And this was entirely what our reading of Hegel was consumed with. And I don't know how Searle can bring in that sort of complexity into his picture. Evidently, he thinks he can. Maybe that's one of the other four books he's writing. Well, he admits in the book, and he admitted in our interview, that he hasn't worked that out. And... Yeah, so I think it's going to be unsatisfying if we do read his books about society. But I know when I'm thinking about white privilege, then I'm just thinking about the things in the world that connote the idea of white privilege in me. And that's why we're going to be next turning to Bell Hooks, Ain't I a Woman from 1981, and probably something else by her. If you want an exact reading selection, check out our new page, partiallyexaminedlife.com slash upcoming. Hey, we're supported by your donations. Please go to partiallyexaminedlife.com to make a contribution. Big donors since last time have included Colin Negrich, Paul Telson, Aaron Berry, Yahil Gur, Michael Shilman, Joseph Rausos, Paul Post, Mitsuyuki Tokeshi, Sergio Lemaitre, Sean Dvorak, Leary Michael, Joe Robertson, Brandon Mitchell, Dot Tran, Benoit Dagnold Pepin, Wayne Schroeder, Tim Hobbs, Matthew Harrington, Robert Nolan, David McCracken, Mike Herrera, Arthur Rucker, Benjamin Crock, Jeffrey Hackard, Alexander Park, Ryan Manhire, Justin Jenkins, Clive Bale, Kenneth Joyner, Zvonimir Patakovic, Jeff Stream, Matt Falkowski, Mikhail Mikertitian, Peter Gollum, Philip Baker, Roman Mankowski, Theodore Brooks, Lucas Anderson, Kyle Sands, Rico Page, Vincent Urban, Daniel Horn, Omar Gaffar, Jeremy Nam, Chad Thurman, and Adam Y. And thanks also to the many $5 a month Partially Examined Life citizens. You're awesome. Yeah, you are. Hey everyone, this is Nathan with the Partially Examined Life, and I have some updates for you from the Citizens Forum and Not School Study Groups. Uh, in the forum, you can propose your own topics for reading. There are things going on there about Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Also, uh, besides reading, there's philosophy and film and the presidential candidacy. 
uh, campaign going forward. So you can get involved in those. For groups that have already begun, you can check out the Not School Study Groups. There's uh, Hegel's Science of Logic there and Intro Readings and Philosophy. A lot for members to get involved and keep a discussion going. So if you want, uh, please go check out PEL's site and uh, get involved as a member. If you have any questions, you can contact me. That's Nathan at PartiallyExaminedLife.com. Follow us on Twitter, discuss with us on Facebook, subscribe to the blog, go subscribe to Nakedly Examined Music at NakedlyExaminedMusic.com, our other podcast. Thank you guys for uh, helping me to interrogate our entertaining guest. And I should say, we're going to have two more of these kind of entertaining guests. I won't reveal the names because maybe they'll cancel. But before the end of summer, we have two more of these big name guests and then we'll be on the map. I thought it was hilarious that Searle did not know what a podcast was, apparently. Really? Based on the comments that he was making to Gordon as we are setting up. Yeah, it's like, what is this? What? The picture? What? How could I hear this event? Like, maybe it's just because he's the age that he is. <laughs> But I think no matter how big we get in the world of philosophy, the big name philosophers of the world are older than we are, <laughs> are older than that well, whole world. I think they just don't pay attention to us. No, so we have to individually get each of them it's okay. in our little, it's okay. <laughs> that would take forever. But hopefully there aren't that many world famous philosophers like John Searle. Do you think regular people, I, when I tell people we're no, going to have them on, they, they didn't, <laughs> but he's one of yeah. them. Take our word for it. He's as famous as you get. As a living philosopher. But. And we caught him. We didn't catch Putnam. We missed him. We Putnam caught this died. guy. He when? did. He so. died less than a month ago. I just <laughs> found out today that we did miss Merle Haggard. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.